My name again is Anna Kitko, and a Christian apologist is my vocation, and that is someone who goes around answering questions about the Bible, Christianity, theology, dealing with objections, historical reliability of the manuscripts, things along those lines, and I teach and train and equip university students with the reasons behind being a Christian. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And it's quite an honor to have been given this opportunity. Uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed, actually, because I happened to read everyone's bios before I got here, which was a grievous mistake, because um, I really should have waited until after my presentation, because I realized just how uh, conspicuous my uh, presence here actually is, given everyone else. Um, so I beg you to bear with me here a little bit, because where my research will not necessarily wow you on a clinical level, um, like maybe some of you would be able to do, it does serve a very important purpose for those of us in this field dealing with the effects of coercive persuasion and the abatement of, of its use. So as clinicians and counselors and some of us apologists, it's our duty to walk beside men and women who are suffering to be able to listen with respect and to speak into the life in front of us in a way that will bring about genuine understanding right, and healing of brokenness. So for many of us, that can be quite difficult because we're dealing with pain that is occurring in a context of dogma and doctrine that we may not actually understand ourselves. Um, Christian apologetics is my field, and we delineate between philosophical eras, right, in order to get a grasp on what worldviews are most prevalent, and our current era is called the post-Christian era. Uh, meaning that the vast majority of the people we are encountering today in the West have been experiencing Christianity on a, as a cultural phenomenon. And it's something that's happening long enough that we no longer recognize its metaphysical reality. And for just long enough, uh, for there to have to be a distinction made between cultural Christianity and Christianity as a religion formal. This means that understanding the basis for dogmas and doctrines is central to operating in a world in which we practice our craft. So the Bible, being the foundation for Christianity, is therefore central for anyone wishing to serve and heal brokenness in this era, whether we agree with the content or not, right? We need to have an, a grasp of what's there. Because interestingly enough, and this is what I'm going to argue to this morning, uh, the New Testament itself actually contains an entire letter outlining in the first century what well, folks like us are formalizing in the 21st century. And that's no small thing. We regularly are dealing with significant hurdles when we try to integrate clinical psychology with Bible-based groups. Even for those of us inside of Christianity doing this work, we often experience significant pushback when it comes to affirming the realities of undue influence and coercive persuasion and those who have been affected by it, right? It's 2019, and we still have to explain to people all the time what it is we do. And slowly, we are being sought out for help with victims experiencing undue influence. So being able to point at the Bible itself as evidence for the research and the advancements being made here at ICSA is profoundly powerful for both we who are inside of Christianity and those who are without. And that's a much welcome relief. Now, for some of you, the technical history that I'm about to give will feel familiar. And presumably, if you're showing up for this talk, and you're not walking out immediately at the title slide. Um, it's because you have a familiarity already with the New Testament. Um, but if not, hang tight. I have to give this context in order for you to understand the case that I'm going to make here. Think of it as a long introduction to what will be a fairly obvious conclusion. In Christianity, there are two very old debates that center around the part of the New Testament commonly referred to as the pastoral epistles. And it's the first of these that attracts the most heat, a letter written presumably by the Apostle Paul to his pastor in training Timothy. The striking thing about this letter is that several years in one missionary journey prior, Paul had established a blossoming Christian community in the already ancient city of Ephesus during his almost three-year tenure ministering personally to the church being built. His letter to the Ephesian church sometime around 62 AD, and you can see it up there, is rife with theological maturity that one would expect in anticipation of a church that had ample time to establish a firm hold on the people and the city in which it was built. But when we fast forward a mere six years, Paul's second letter regarding the church there addressed to his companion who had been left in Ephesus, we find a completely different tone. 
Timothy is instead being abruptly counseled on bizarrely phrased specifics of how to deal with the false teachings that have been markedly enough embraced to warrant a letter by the then condemned Paul. Paul knew that his beheading was imminent by the Emperor Nero. So he had limited time and limited space to write a letter. Why pick this subject in the first place? And why be so forceful in your advice giving? It's rather odd. What could have possibly crept into the church in Ephesus in such a short period of time that would take the once articulate and theologically thorough Paul to hastily pen a letter that covers a myriad of quite frankly odd and very personal church issues in such a strangely blunt and seemingly abrupt tone of voice? And those two very old debates were what I originally set out to solve when I began my research. Uh, the first being the debate over whether the letter was actually written by Paul in any sense, because one of the conclusions often drawn is that the letter could not have been Pauline and is therefore fraudulent and should be cast out of the canon of scripture entirely. Um, and secondly, how does the content apply to women in the modern church? because the content of this letter appears to limit the role of women in major ministry positions, and those limitations have been debated for decades. But what happened instead was that as I was tracing through the historical contexts, I began noticing that there was a direct correlation between what the author was saying to Timothy and what we as counselors do when we educate on coercive persuasion. <coughs> huh. It was an unexpected surprise to me, and that, in fact, the key to understanding the focus of the letter itself is in its intention to deal honestly and clearly with a very complicated content and to focus on the role of women in ministry as necessary and important to keep very clear, both very Pauline virtues. But interestingly enough, I was struck by the fact that once the details of what was happening in Ephesus became plain, the, that Paul's focus on training Timothy was countercult exclusive and quite possibly the earliest recorded bite model in history. So now that you understand the greater framework in which the argument's going to rest, then we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the details. The explanation for the debate surrounding 1 Timothy fall to a combination of factors that were a result of a single man who scripture recalls briefly, but who history recalls remarkably a young man by the name of Simon Magus, you may have heard of him. Most of what we have discovered regarding Simon stems from the early church fathers who Stephen studies regularly. Um, <laughs> appropriately, his followers were called the Simonians. The vast majority of information comes from Clement I, Bishop of Rome, and although information is ample, we have alternative options as well, including an event that's recorded in Acts chapter eight, where we encounter where the term simony originates. Right? That's the attempted buying and selling of ecclesiastical privileges, which in the original case was an attempt to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit for the use in sorcery. And Simon had been baptized, of course, into the disciples of Jesus Christ's fold, but he had done so for reasons other than repentance and belief. And he is harshly rebuffed by the Apostle Peter for the attempt to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. First century literature gives us significantly more detail, though, about the character Simon. Clementine literature documents that Simon was a Samaritan and a follower of John the Baptist initially and during Jesus' public ministry. Um, it wasn't until John the Baptist was arrested and consequently beheaded that Simon sought to advance his role as leader of the group. They called themselves, the followers of John the Baptist, were called the Thirty. And we have documentation that there was some significant infighting as to who would be the next leader of the group and that Simon had won by using his charming and charismatic character to sway some of the members while the ones who disagreed with his forcefulness were socially stigmatized <coughs> as lesser in spiritual prowess than he. And he had spent his youth studying sorcery in Alexandria and as a result had garnered the ability to captivate an audience with the same skills as the infamous Janus and Jambres. Remember that the title sorcery at this point in time in history was about like a, 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 a successful street magician. To demonstrate just how effective Egyptian trained sorcerers were, Mark Kern documents every skill set attributed to Simon Megas with respect to the sorcery accounts in Exodus and the effectiveness of Pharaoh's sorcerers when they, if they successfully replicated the plagues before Aaron and Moses, and then Aaron and Moses take over after the fact. It's important to note that Simon's powers and prominence were such that even Emperor Claudius had been taken aback by them and converted 
after which the result was a statue being commissioned and placed in the center of the Tiber River, reading Simone Deo Sancto, to Simon, the holy God. Followed by the edicts that anyone who disagreed with Simon's purported powers or who took issue with his teachings were expelled from Rome. And not so amazingly, amongst those who are expelled are ex-members of the 30 who had left the group due to the, his deceitfulness and his power hungriness, who had over the course of the years evolved from captivating street magician to charismatic narcissist, who actually begins believing his own propaganda. He begins donning the title the standing one in reference to his self-ascribed divinity and therefore incorruptibility exclusively surrounding himself with devotees who would promote and feed his narcissism. Members of the original 30 who stood up to his obvious mistruths were expelled from the group, causing new members to fear being kicked out as well. One example, and there are lots, and it is a case where members are asked to procure a young son of a bond servant, um, who Simon consequently murders and then rigs a contraption around his body that when manipulated would make the boy's body appear to move. This is what he would use to demonstrate to new converts his ability to resurrect the dead. Interesting. But as one historian records, this was the last straw for a couple of the higher-ups in his hierarchy, as such a blatant misleading of the public and the grievousness of being willing to murder someone in pursuit of a greater following was too much for them to bear any longer. And we're all very familiar with psychopathology of a leader employing undue influence over his or her members. And Simon Megas is no exception. Take a look. We have evidence of everything from narcissism so extreme and grandiose that they exist in a kind of splendid isolation in which the creation of the grandiose self takes precedence over legal, moral, or interpersonal commitments as the marvelous Madeline Lando so articulately describes and continues paranoia as evident in elaborate delusions of persecution. Criticism is interpreted as a deliberate attack upon him and the group. Real belief in omnipotence and magical powers is trackable and it is, evolves from adolescence to adulthood, culminating in the final iteration of ascribing divinity to himself. There's evidence of megalomania, the belief that one is entitled to power over the world at large and beneath the gloss of charisma, intelligence, social magnetism, and charm, we find ex-members reporting that in actuality, their worlds were ones of keeping a passive submissive state and aiding in the financial increase of their guru in spite of his angry outbursts insecurity, and fear of exposure. Any of this beginning to sound familiar? Like some of the cases we work with every day, charismatic leader with psychological instability forms God complex, the result of which is a powerful falling full of stories of abuse and scandal. And I'm only slightly grazing the surface with what Simon and his followers are recorded as doing. As an overarching principle, when you think of the Simonians, and if this is the first time you've heard this title, think Nexium mixed with children of God's flirty fishing tactics, a hierarchy reminiscent of the Sea Org, and a leader as brazen in his fraud as Joseph Smith being found guilty of glass looking in his 1826 trial, less than a year before admitting that exactly the same function had been the means through which he translated the Book of Mormon. All eight of Lifton's criteria for thought reform are present in this group. Milieu control is achieved by Simon through restriction of how his stunts were being performed, as well as in the isolation of his followers when the public began to question the authenticity of his purported sorcery. He and his followers regularly utilized planned spontaneity by requiring crowds to come to them for performances or through scouting locations beforehand. There is one instance recorded where the Apostle Peter is so fed up with this, that he rallies the crowd to simply follow Simon's group back to their compound to see if a boy that Simon claimed was resurrected is still alive, right? A falsifiable claim. Simon refuses to allow it. In the case of sacred science, confession, and the demand for purity, Simon and his consort Helen were to be considered not only above criticism, but also the only voices of God. Sins, as defined by the group, were to be handled without confidentiality, and with the induction of guilt by the group should the individual fail to perform. This is most noteworthy in the call for enlightenment and self-improvement through engaging in evangelistic prostitution throughout Rome and into Greece. The most famous case, of course, being Simon's consort Helen herself, a very famous and coveted prostitute 
in Rome and in the Roman Empire, and she was from the, the city of Tyre. You can look her up if you'd like. And over time, a teaching developed in Simon's circle, and the teaching went that sex was an avenue through which fullness with God was achieved, something that seems to be a bit of a theme for many of these coercive leaders. It looks like he had become smitten with his consort of empire-wide ill repute and needed justification for how a demigod himself could have behaved in such a way. And so he began teaching that actually, actions that were only carnal but did not result in pregnancy, a feat that prostitution was wont to be successful at accomplishing, was the highest experience of enlightenment. Men and women were to regularly conduct themselves in a manner that provided for ample excuse for such engagements. And it therefore comes as no surprise that Simonianism consequently enjoyed a surge in new converts, desiring to experience enlightenment themselves. <laughs> Case in point. You're going to see here on the screen, this is a real place, this is Ephesus, downtown. First century Roman latrines attached to a brothel dating to the same time that I'm describing, first century, um, in Ephesus, downtown Ephesus. And human urges, of course, were commonly a social experience in the Roman Empire, and relieving oneself is no exception. In fact, there are 35 toilet seats in front of you in this room alone, complete with running water at one's feet, which would carry your business past the person sitting next to you. And of course, design like this served to provide an environment for advertisement. One example you'll see on the right is located inside of the bathroom, pointing guests towards a hidden corridor beneath the latrine, which would curry you privately across the street to where you'd be able to engage in procuring a prostitute. This is quite literally a first century example of bathroom stall graffiti. For a good time, call this number. And it comes as no surprise, as scholars argue, to what extent the cult of Artemis played in all of this. But they all agree that she's a very ancient and extremely local deity, not to be confused with the Artemis or the Diana of Greek and Roman mythology. Um, but her chief focus was on sex and fertility. So a Simonian presence in the city would have been seen as a somewhat natural fit and rife with the cultural climate, used to a heavy emphasis on what Simonianism would already be practicing. So we've established a coercive group with enough power and influence to convert even the emperor himself. And we've established that Ephesus possesses the ideal location for such a group to flourish. But how did the group get there exactly, and how is it that Paul was acquainted enough with his teachings to be able to counsel Timothy remotely on what to do about it, right? We're setting up the stage. We have to still get this group from Rome to Ephesus. I submit to you this, and I'll be brief because we don't have enough time to go over all of these details, but there is, what I, there is something that I suspect happened here, and I think it's extremely plausible. Um, amongst the original 30 followers of John the Baptist is a man by the name of Aquila. This is the same Aquila as the husband of Prisca, who traveled with Paul setting up churches, including Ephesus, documented in the book of Acts. When Emperor Claudius expelled dissenters of Simonianism from Rome, Roman historian Suetonius is the one that documents this, uh, Prisca and Aquila were amongst the numbers expelled, and it's the result of their expulsion that they end up running into Paul and befriending him, and then accompanying him throughout Greece, setting up churches. Okay, pause there. That's information you need. Recall from your knowledge of the Bible the fact that Jesus not only commissioned the 12 apostles, <laughs> but that he told his 12 to stay out of Samaria for the time being, and that's the place where Simon was practicing. Um, this would have been this very same time period where Simon was garnering traction with his disciples. <coughs> Later on in Christ's ministry, he then commissions 70 <coughs> disciples traveling in pairs to begin evangelizing. We know from Paul's other letters that there were members of the 70 appointed by Christ who are sent out into greater Samaria who abandoned their commissions. There are also very few individuals who Paul names as specifically dangerous in the scriptures. Three of them belong to the original 70 that Christ had appointed and were also companions of Paul at an earlier date. Of those three, Phygelus, Hermogenes, and Demas are of particular importance because not only is Timothy warned specifically about them while he is stationed in Ephesus, but also because the only other time these two men, Phygelus and Hermogenes, are mentioned in history 
specifically, they are documented as the first bishops of Ephesus. Okay, so putting the puzzle pieces together, we now have a plausible way for Simonianism to have jumped from Rome and into Ephesus rapidly. We also have an explanation for why Paul would be writing so emphatically to Timothy about it. And because what happened was that Phygelus, Hermogenes, Prisca, Aquila, Paul, and Timothy had all uh, had a hand in establishing and running a brand new Christian church in Ephesus. But once Prisca, Aquila, and Paul had left to continue church planting, Phygelus and Hermogenes began using their excuse of authority and their new titles to begin teaching what they had been exposed to in Samaria instead of Christianity. This is why Paul adds hastily to his letters to Timothy not to have anything to do with these men who had abandoned their original commission and not to follow them to, or not to allow them to discredit Timothy publicly due to his youth. Okay, those seemingly random warnings in the text, and those of you who have read 1 Timothy, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they're not random, okay? And in fact, as we will see, I suspect that Aquila and Prisca helped counsel Paul on what precisely to warn Timothy to anticipate moving forward with the undue influence spreading. And of course, we should expect this to be the case if undue influence is in fact being experienced or has been experienced by ex-members of a damaging cult group. I'll put up Schwartz's pathology on perpetration. We know well that there's a specific cognitive dissonance phenomenon that occurs when victims of course of persuasion begin experiencing their perpetrator's abuses. And Aquila is no exception, having experienced the phenomenon personally. We can see clearly from his testimony and that of another ex-member of the 30, um, that all the time that they had spent with Simon, in, uh, that they had done so in spite of knowing about his fraud. And the reasons they give are the same reasons ex-cult members give. The adage, no one ever joins a cult, they just postpone leaving, is true in this case. Uh, we see other elements of damaging cult life from selective inattention, denying the consequences of various abuses of the public, to ignoring the connections between Simon's teachings on prostitution, to valuing of the re reduction of anxiety above the breaking of moral and ethical standards by Simon himself. I'm reminded of Diedrich Bonhoeffer's admonition on the, these things, when he says silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. And I think in this case, this was the foundation that laid the groundwork for Simon's following. But this is also the groundwork that gives credence to our hypothesis regarding the reasons behind penning 1 Timothy. If you map the letter closely, you'll notice that Paul addresses and directly teaches against the parameters that allow perpetration to occur. He says directly, pay close attention, confront instances of abuse, take particular care of women and children who have experienced trauma, fight against cultural norms that perpetuate sexual slavery, sacrifice your own comforts for the sake of ethical moral standards. And even more robustly, Paul calls this instance of course of persuasion as serious as dealing with evil on a demonic level. But most importantly, Paul counsels Timothy to guard the truth as precious because of his specific calling as a leader and counselor to others caught up in this. In this context, then, we can see and unravel all of the odd bits of the text itself. Firstly, the tone of the emergency and the rushed rhetoric is due to the gravity of what is happening in Ephesus. Secondly, the specific teachings he warns against correlate exactly to what was being taught in Simonianism. False genealogies, exclusivism, inappropriate attire for women. You remember how I said that Simon would teach that achieving fullness through ritualized sex was how one achieved enlightenment. Well, in the Greek text itself, Paul references this teaching by using the term epigenosis, which is a pun in reference to those who have full knowledge or have been thoroughly enjoying the carnal splendors of having joined Simon's group. Paul's oddly specific focus on Christ as a single mediator between God and man also has a direct impact on Simonian teachings as they taught that there were two mediators between God and man. When Paul warns against those who are forbidding marriage, as Simonianism did, in order to remain operating within the confines of Roman law, because the sharing of sexual partners, if unmarried, fell into the jurisdiction of prostitution and was therefore protected. Paul concludes that women will thereby be delivered through childbirth. A very odd turn of phrase, unless we look at it through the lens of exit counseling. If Timothy begins being successful at warning against this group, the practical reality of their redemption out of a coercive group will be that they begin having children again. 
And when Paul comforts Timothy with the suggestion that he take a little wine in his water for the sake of his health, knowing how overwhelming it can be when you're a single person up against an arena of others who do not happen to like the accusations you're leveling against their cult leader, is it any wonder to we here who are up against the very same odds every day? Can we not identify with the exhaustion and need for a much deserved glass of wine when we come home from work? You see, in this interpretation of the text, the original two debates that I set out to solve are solved. It's, it just isn't in the way I thought it would be. And isn't that always what happens when one pursues truth by simply following the facts? You don't always end up where you thought you would, but where you end up is glorious nonetheless. Uh, the oddities of this text, given a correct context of countercult counseling, end up justifying the author in an even stronger way than we could have imagined. And Paul, a character who regularly seeks to correct error, openly and honestly, ends up bolstering his high regard for women in the first century by seeking to deliver them out of sexual slavery and abuse. What we have here in the New Testament is not an obscure letter that we should ignore, but rather a remarkable tool for we in this field. We have at our fingertips a reference in the most influential piece of literature the world has ever known, an example of why what we do here at EXA is so necessary and important. And if I'm correct in my assessment here, we have a preeminent bridge between the secular and the sacred in the Bible itself. How remarkable is that? So the crux of the issue then is this, ladies and gentlemen, if and when we find ourselves working in circles that affirm the usefulness or necessity of the scriptures in order to drive their understanding of the world, we possess arguably the most powerful tool we can wield in that person's life as counselors and clinicians. The fact that the foundation for their belief, the New Testament itself, contains an account of precisely what we do here at ICSA, cult awareness, education, exit counseling, and warning the public and that Paul's letters to Timothy are, in effect, a Christian model for teaching against undue influence and coercive persuasion. Any questions? I'm saying why. That's tremendous. Oh, thank you. Ma'am. Well, it's amazing. I mean, I I've never heard anything like this before. It's quite new to me. So how did you how did you put this together? How, what was the background that made you see this? So my role with our global ministry is called Ratio Christi, the Reason for Christ. And that's just a, a whole network of Christian apologists, and we station ourselves on university campuses across the globe. And our goal is, is to make sure that we're there as support for the students. Um, but my role as in the global ministry is as cults and new religion specialists because my background is in course of persuasion and undue influence. And quite by accident, I stumbled into ICSA and I'm here with all of you very important and intelligent individuals. Um, but I'm just kind of an oddity. And so when I was doing my research on First Timothy, I was, um, I, was, I was set up and asked to solve these two problems in, in the text. And these are two problems that, that the role of women in ministry, as well as did Paul actually write the letter. Um, and as I was trying to solve that problem and looking at what's happening in Ephesus and all the context, I was like, this looks just like what we do to exit counsel Jehovah's Witnesses who have been you know, determined that they need to be disfellowshipped or apostatized, or what we do with some of, the, some of the more difficult groups that I deal with in Tennessee, for example. And so I started just kind of earmarking them as I was going through the text and reading through the patristic uh, accounts of what Simon was doing, things along those lines, and I was like, We've been missing this this whole time because in my field, the assumption for how you solve First Timothy is that Paul was dealing with Gnosticism, but Gnosticism wasn't around for another 200 years. And so it's a very odd fitting shoe to try to force Gnostic theology into those parameters and it doesn't explain the entirety of the text. So what, say, the egalitarian side of Christianity does is say, we're not really sure what to do with this, so we're gonna put it aside for now. And what the complementarian side of Christianity says is that, well, let's just look at it through Gnosticism and start really making firm um, decisions based on uh, leadership, based on our understanding of that, and it doesn't really work. And I just said, well, let's not, let's just get rid of the presumption that Gnosticism is here at all, and we'll just let the text speak for itself. And I just found I couldn't ignore it. It looked just like exit counseling. So at the end of it, I was like, well, I guess I'm writing a paper on the fact that we've been missing the point this whole time. And the whole point is that we, even we who are here in this field, 
articulating what we do, do you not find that you're constantly having to describe to people like what is coercive persuasion? What is undue influence? What is a cult? What is the difference between a destructive cult and a, a non-destructive cult? Those types of things. We're still doing that in, my, in the modern age. So the fact that this point would have been missed this whole time because is just because we haven't gotten there yet. We're just now formalizing what we do. And that's the only reason why I was able to even identify what Paul was doing back then. And I found it's a much better fitting shoe than what we've been presuming this whole time. So I hope that's helpful. You, 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 um, <coughs> you have suggested really quite a powerful way of um, approaching people who are victims of coercive persuasion or are perpetrating coercive persuasion in, in the name of Christianity. Okay. Uh, people who, who say they believe in Christianity and they're actually involved in harmful cults. Um, your argument, I think, is very powerful, but I think it would be equally powerful even if you didn't go into the question of the authorship of Christianity. Okay. Because, I mean, there are other issues that cast doubt on the authorship of Christianity. And um, I think getting into the question of that, um, in, in, in some ways, might weaken the force of your argument. Well, you know, if I were presenting at, say, a Jesus Seminar, for example, I might just refer to it as the author. Because yeah. you're, you're right, the, the, the argument stands whether I say it's Pauline or not. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and feel free to do that if you're in, if you're in those circles. Yeah. Okay. All right. When are you publishing this, or where are you publishing this? Good question. I'm not certain yet, but I'll, what I'll do is I'll try to make sure Mike has access, and that way you all have access. Thank you. My pleasure. Is that through Exit, then, through, through the website? Well, I, as far as the publishing is concerned, oh, right, okay, yeah. yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain yet. But when it does get published, wherever it does get published, I'll make sure that Mike Lagone has has all the access, yeah. so that you all will have access to it as well. And at, at the very least, you'll have a copy of it that you don't have to, you know, necessarily buy. But of course, when the book comes out, I expect you all to. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> Are you writing? I'm working on it. Yeah. Yes. There are only a few other accounts from this period that I know of. Of cult leaders, ones from the second century, uh, uh, cult of, of Lycon. Yes. Um, and also, there was a Roman uh, uh, law in the 50 BC uh, against the, the Bacchanalian cult. I don't think it was, I've never heard of it, it got enforced, but the Romans certainly wrote a law trying to prevent the drinking and, and orgies that were going on. Mm -hmm. And there's also some literature about uh, the debates between. Christians and pagans, each one calling the other cults. Yes, very good. That's and true. So uh, there's a way to put this into a context. It's a small context, and that's what makes your paper very important. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to make it about everything. We just have to focus just on this one for now, yeah. and then we can go from there. But I think this is a pretty strong example of precisely what we do. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's a privilege. I'm delighted. Thank, Thank you. you very much.